Well, good morning, Valley View Community Church and anyone else joining us for our Sunday morning worship service this morning or afternoon or evening or whenever you're watching this uh, from my hot, humid, air conditionless uh, basement to your house. I uh, wish you the peace and the love of Christ today and trust you will uh, experience the love of Christ, not just be a listener uh, consuming something today, but that you would really experience, that you would taste and see uh, the goodness and the light and the love of Christ today. Um, why don't we recite these words and remind ourselves as we typically do why we take time out on this uh, Sunday, whether you're gathered uh, in your home or you're traveling this weekend. Let's remind ourselves uh, why we take time for worship on Sunday. We have gathered in the name of Jesus Christ. We have come to this house to worship God. We've come to confess that Jesus is Lord. We're not here to be entertained. We're here to encounter the sacred. We are not consumers. We are worshipers. We praise and adore the living God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We also want to acknowledge, as we always do, that as we gather to worship this morning, we do so on the traditional territory of the Atigamishek, Anishinaabek, and Wanapate peoples here in Greater Sudbury, who have stewarded this land for generations. We honor them and commit to learning how to be better stewards of the land that we share with them, and with all of God's people. I want to read uh, from Psalm 34 this morning as we settle in, a passage that's been on my heart this week and will tie into the message uh, a little bit later in our time together. Uh, reading Psalm 34 verses 1 to 8. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that we can taste and see your goodness. We are not gathered today just to hear about you, to read about you, to sing about you. We want to experience your goodness, your grace, your light, and your love afresh uh, in our time together. And we recognize that we can experience you moment by moment and day by day. It's not reserved to these uh, seemingly sacred times together, but all experiences can be sacred to the degree we acknowledge uh, your presence within and among us. But there's something special about what we're doing now, and we, we pray that all hearts, all minds would be open uh, to hear, to listen, respond to your grace, to the Spirit speaking to us, uh, encourage us, comfort us, challenge us. You know what we need more than we even know what we need ourselves. And so we, we open up our hearts and our minds to hear from you now. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we read Psalm 34 uh, about tasting and seeing the goodness of God. And we're just going to spend a few moments uh, just quieting our hearts uh, in song. I've got a, a song that I've been meditating upon the last few days, preparing uh, for our Sunday gathering. And I wanted to, to share this with all of us today um, as we settle in. So uh, perhaps maybe this day or this week you've been burdened. Maybe you've been weighed down uh, by some things in your schedule, workplace, relationships, um, I just pray that this time together would be healing, it would be comforting, and that this time in the next few minutes would just allow us to sort of just exhale anything that might be restricting us uh, from hearing and experiencing uh, the healing grace and love of God. So let's just take a few moments just to, to, to breathe, uh, to breathe out anything that might be hindering us from hearing from God today, and let's just breathe in afresh uh, the love and the grace of Jesus as we worship together for a few minutes in song.
ashamed This poor man cried Was saved from his trust The angel of the Lord Surrounds his saints And delivers them Oh, taste and see that he Trust in Him, oh, taste and see that He is good, He is good, good to me. Feel the Lord, oh, you is saved. Those who fear Him, they have no want. Young lions suffer hunger, but those who seek Him lack no good thing. Come, O oh children, listen to me. I'll counsel you in the fear of Yahweh. Which one of you wants to live a life that's rich and long and full of good? Keep your tongue from evil words, hold back your lips from speaking lies, depart from me. And go after it Oh, taste and see that He is good Blessed is He who trusts in Him Oh, taste and see that He is good He is good The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous And His ears listen for their cry The face of the Lord is against the wicked Their legacy will fade away cry out the Lord hears he saves them out of all their trials he's near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit many are the afflictions of his faithful saints will be condemned the lord redeems his servant souls and none of them will be condemned oh taste and see that he is good blessed is he who trusts in him oh taste and see He is good, good to me. He is good.
man, just good to sit quietly in the presence of God and uh, with loved ones, perhaps you're with others. Um, it's good. It's good to do this, not only on Sunday, but uh, I encourage us to uh, make a healthy rhythm, healthy rhythm where we can spend some quiet moments just uh, listening, maybe walking, driving, just find some time. You don't really need to add a lot to what might be an already busy schedule for you, but just uh, reorient how you're doing things. For me, it's sometimes just turning the radio off when I'm driving and just having moments of silence. Um, just find some creative ways where you can uh, continually, regularly acknowledge and practice uh, the presence of God, do that tasting and seeing the goodness of God, uh, even in the mundane activities of your life. It's good that we can do that. I got a few announcements I want to bring to your attention. Uh, not a lot going on during the summer months. Uh, one thing we are continuing to do in our 13th year is our, our real life drive in movie theater, which really has been a blessing for a lot of people in the community. I had a good crowd again Friday night and had a few good conversations uh, with people just inquiring about our church and appreciative of what we're doing. And so it's, it's always uh, encouraging and exciting just to meet uh, more and more people in our neighborhood neighborhood taking note of who we are and what we're doing and uh, thanks to all the volunteers who continue to come out faithfully and help uh, a, lot of, a lot of young high school girls shout out to Cynthia and her friends uh, who have been there regularly every week and our summer student Steve and others uh, three more weeks three more opportunities to either attend uh, one of our movie nights or volunteer at one of our movie nights uh, this week will be kind of fun it's uh, a 90s night so we're encouraging attendees to don some 90s outfits and we'll have some prizes and some giveaways one of my favorite uh, hidden gems from the 90s uh, the movies called sneakers uh, starring robert redford uh, Sidney poitier uh, dan Aykroyd, and others uh, so that'll be happening uh, around nine o'clock uh, this friday so if you'd like to volunteer you'd like to attend invite some friends and family uh, plan to have a movie night out uh, this friday at the church uh, next sunday um, i'll be preaching and then i'll be taking some vacation I'll be away for two weeks, but we will be having in-person services. But on Sunday, September the 4th, that's the long weekend, Labor Day long weekend, uh, just a reminder that that will be an online service only. Uh, but the next three weeks throughout the rest of August, we will be having both in-person and online services. And then we'll look at getting into some fall kickoff stuff and resuming our children's ministry and other things we've got planned for about the middle of September. We'll get that all ramped up and more information on that forthcoming. I also want to just take uh, take a minute to, to acknowledge uh, the goodness and the generosity of God and to, to thank those who uh, continue to give faithfully to support the work and the life of our church. Um, we are uh, huddling up with a new board. We're welcoming uh, Sarah and Lise on our board of directors and we'll be meeting a couple times uh, between now and September. We're hoping to get together and sort of roll out a, a ministry plan for the new year. Uh, we're going to... Uh, work through a life plan discernment process as a church we just feel it's a it's the opportune time and season just to gather and regather uh, the church family together to really press into uh, the good things that uh, god wants to continue to do in and through us and so uh, it really is a season where we want all hands on deck and uh, if you've been uh, sort of a little bit disconnected uh, during the pandemic, uh, we, would, uh, we would love to see you and connect. Um, if you're up for a visit, I'd love to visit you. Uh, if, you're, if you're feeling maybe it's time to, to regather in person for Sundays or be a part of a small group, um, you can talk to me about that. But I, I thank each and every one of you for your generous giving during this season. And uh, if you'd like to give an offering uh, to support the work of Valley View Community Church, you can do so uh, via e-transfer at valleyviewfinancial at gmail.com. Around here, our mandate comes from 2 Corinthians 9, 7, as it relates to generosity. Uh, it says, each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly, not under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So we recognize that everything we have is entrusted to us from God, and he calls us to be good stewards and managers of what he has given us. And so I'd like to pray over uh, what's happening in the life of our church over the summer months, as well as the offerings. Lord God, thank you for your generous love, revealed most clearly and fully and finally in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Everything we have comes from you, the Father of lights. And uh, we thank you 
that you have entrusted us with so much. You've given us talents and, and time to use and, and treasures. And to the degree we can, we can come together and pool some of these resources, we can continue to do the work of your kingdom that you have called Valley View Community Church to near and far. Uh, give us discernment in this season as we prepare to wind down the summer months and launch into some, some new and renewed efforts to, to care for one another and care for this community. Uh, we pray you'll give us wisdom and discernment on how to use what you have entrusted to us well to extend your light and your love. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, um, it's good to be back with you this week after a long weekend. Uh, I, and I'm sure many of you, were away. Um, it was a, it was, it's been an interesting few weeks for me and my household. Um, we're hoping to get a good bit of rest this summer. I was feeling... Uh, I wouldn't say burnout, but approaching sort of burnout state this spring. And uh, my body was telling me, along with my, my wife and the board of directors, just to kind of to slow down a little bit. So I've been trying to, to heed those voices of wisdom and my own body telling me to slow down and been able to get to our trailer on Manitoulin Island a little bit for some rest and refreshment. Uh, but we've been in the midst of uh, some major home renovations uh, this summer. We haven't really done any major renovations in our house uh, in the last 11 plus years we've been here and just felt it was uh, time to do some upgrades and uh, so we've been involved with uh, doing some of the work ourselves and contracting some of the work out uh, involving you know knocking down some walls opening up our kitchen and dining area and getting some new cabinets and new floors in and we're, we're in the process of this and so uh, most of the work that i and my wife sylvie have been doing is a lot of the sort of the deconstruction work uh, the, the grunt work uh, i'm not a professional handyman I've, I've learned a lot being a homeowner and working at the church but i'm by no means an expert but uh, one thing that we've been busy doing is uh, tearing out uh, floors in the kitchen the old floors and tearing out the old cupboards and doing some painting and getting ready for the new cabinets to be installed and eventually the, the new floors will be installed and and I, I share all this because the the title of my message and and here's a, a picture on screen of what we've been up to in our kitchen doing the deconstruction work the last couple weeks uh, the title of the message is God is light subtitle lessons from the kitchen lessons from my kitchen and i'll become clear uh how my kitchen work ties into the message today but we're working through uh first john first john is uh the first of, of three short letters from john uh nearing the end of the new testament nearing the end of this this long journey we've been on through the grand story of scripture we'll be in first john for a couple more weeks really a, a book of the new testament that has is a real warm place in my heart and i'm not alone i'm in good company uh john wesley the the founder of the methodist movement we are a part of um it's it's been made known and uh, scholars will will notice that he was quite fond of this this letters too uh, i think he preached more from from first john than than most other places in the new testament really uh a small letter that's just so focused on the core, the, the light and the love of God and, and just centering that and, and the implications of uh, centering the love and the light of Christ and what that means for how we think and how we act. And uh, so the title of the message today, God is Light, really just zooming in primarily on one verse. A verse that I have alluded to, a verse that I've mentioned many times throughout this journey uh, in 1 John 1, 5, and the secondary verse uh, is uh, Psalm 34, 8. We've already read that this morning, taste and see uh, that the Lord is good. And so I just want to read uh, a little bit, having shared <laughs> a little bit about uh, my, uh, my kitchen work, and I'm going to tie together some things that the Spirit was putting on my heart as I was doing some of this difficult physical labor of the last couple weeks um, 
even doing the mundane activity, the uh, the unenviable activity, as you'll hear, of removing uh, some tiles and some old linoleum floors from my kitchen, uh, God was speaking to me. Uh, I was trying to listen in the midst of the sweat and uh, the frustration and the challenge of this work. God was present and God was active. And so I want to connect the dots between uh, some real life experiences uh, to what John has to say in the scripture this morning. So let me read. Let's open the scripture. Sure, if you've got your Bibles with you, you're welcome to track along. I'm going to read the first five verses from 1 John chapter 1, uh, zooming in uh, particularly on verse 5 today. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed and we have seen it and testified to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. It's the word of the Lord for the people of God. Uh, this is a, a powerful statement. And uh, John, right out of the gate in his letter, he's, this is not, you know, a game of telephone. He's not uh, relaying what someone else has told him or three other people have told him about Jesus. There's, there's not seven degrees of separation here. Uh, this is something, this is like a first-hand eyewitness account. And not only an account, but Clearly, John is writing based on something that he's seen and experienced, echoing the psalmist that we read earlier, taste and see. This is a person who has tasted, who has seen, uh, who is very passionate about uh, the light and the love of Jesus. And so today we want to focus on the light of God, what it means when we say God is light and there's no darkness in him at all. And then next week we'll pivot uh, to the the main theme and the theme of themes, that that famous verse, I think the most important verse, the most important three words I would argue in the whole of the Bible, God is love. And so we'll pivot to that next week. And so this is the message that John is writing out of his experiences, out of his passion, out of his love that he has received from Christ. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. And yet the reality is that as we've been moving through this grand story journey, we have bumped up against plenty of passages uh, where there is much darkness. Uh, There is much darkness in the human condition. And if we take the Bible seriously, and we always want to take the Bible seriously, there is much darkness attributed to God. And from time to time, as we've bumped up against some of the tough passages of Scripture, the head-scratching passages where God seemingly is commanding or saying or doing things that look nothing like Christ, the love and the grace we see in Jesus Christ, we've had to wrestle, we've had to grapple with how to reconcile those passages. And uh, it's usually in those messages and those sermons that I've alluded to this particular passage we are finally getting to today. And I, I believe there are certain passages in the Bible And we can say, and we have said, and we will continue to say that uh, we believe that the the Bible is inspired by God uh, from cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelation. It's inspired by God, but it's penned by human authors uh, who have received the inspiration of God. And God has given them freedom to respond to God's inspiration in their own place, in their own time, in their own particular way of communicating different genres, some poetry, some narrative, some wisdom liturgy, uh, um, literature, excuse me. Um, And God has given freedom for his children. We have the Bible that we have because God lets his children write the story. God doesn't micromanage or coerce what is written, but God is inspiring. God is breathing nonetheless. And so, because that's the Bible we have, and we've been down this road the last couple of years, sometimes from time to time it can get messy. And from time to time, um, if we are not reading the Bible in community, 
uh, with with Christ uh, sort of eyes and lenses to see the Bible, Old and New Testament, what we can do is we can uh, consciously or often subconsciously, uh, we can attribute darkness to God. We can come to the conclusion that God has a dark side, that God might be 99.9% .9 light, but there is that 0.1% that uh, of God that is mean, that is nasty, that is untrustworthy. And that can lead uh, to a lot of, what I like to say, stinking thinking about God. And it can lead to activities that are less than Christ-like too, because if we believe God has a dark side, or there's darkness within God's character, or God takes off his light hat and puts on his dark hat from time to time. Uh, he becomes unloving. Uh, and if we're created in the image and likeness of God, then we can very easily, and history has shown, sadly, throughout history, uh, those declaring to follow God have done things in the name of God that have been violent, that have been abusive, that have been dehumanizing, and if we think God has a dark side, it's very easy for us to justify being created in the image and likeness of God. We can do things in the name of God that maybe aren't loving and aren't extending the light and the grace of God. Uh, I think certainly throughout history, we think of the Crusades in the Middle Ages, the conquests, uh, colonization, right? Uh, when those the colonizers came from Europe to North America for God and for country, it was a manifest destiny. They were destined to take this land and horrific things have and continue to be done. And we're, we're coming to grips with the reality of the horrific activities and actions from the church towards our indigenous population here in Canada and other uh, racial minorities and sexual minorities and, and other groups that have been dehumanized and mistreated, often in the name of God and or country. But here is the message. God is light and in him there is absolutely no darkness at all. Do you, do you believe that to be true? Have you experienced the light and the love of God? And perhaps if we're honest in our humanness, uh, in our, in our uh, disconnection from God and in the struggles and the trials of life, doubts come in to play and sometimes we might doubt that God is light and God is love. When we look to Christ, when we, when we taste and see, as the psalmist reminds us to do so, we've read about and sung about already this morning, we are reminded and experience afresh. This is one reason we gather. We experience afresh in the midst of the darkness and brokenness and injustice in the world, we can be reminded that God is indeed light. And in him there is absolutely no darkness at all. And so, so why do we, why do we have trouble believing this? Well, there, there are two reasons. W one reason is, you know, as we've been going through this grand story journey, when we read the Bible, sometimes we will bump a buck, bump up against uh, dark depictions of God in the Bible. And I'll just put one as an example. There are many. One that we encountered a couple of years ago as we started out this grand story journey in the first few chapters of Genesis. Let's talk about briefly you know, Noah. Noah and the ark. And I recall growing up, you know, I had Noah's Ark wallpaper in my room, a Noah's Ark piggy bank. You go to Sunday school class and you have coloring pages that are similar to what we see here on screen. You go out and get Noah and, you know, this, these beautiful pairs of animals and the lovely rainbows there. The monkeys are swinging from the palm trees. There's pink flamingos in the pool of water and all is well. And... And if you've never really taken seriously what the story is about, you might come to the conclusion that this is a children's story. But the reality is, the story of Noah and Noah's Ark is anything but a children's story. If we take it seriously, and we should always take the Bible seriously, uh, it's a story of, and if you, if you take it literally, it's a story of mass genocide. It's a story of God totally wiping out uh, every living thing on the face of the earth except for one faithful family and two of each uh, animal in the animal kingdom. Um, so, you know, it's not a children's story. And if we're honest and if we're, we're reading the Bible seriously and critically, um, we can attribute that to be a very 
dark depiction of God. God is wiping out everything and everyone. And yet there are other ways to read and to understand stories like this based on what John is saying here, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. The reality is that that mass genocide, even if God's commanding it, that is dark. We, we intuit, we know that that is not light and that is not love. And so it would encourage us, as we've been doing on this journey, whenever we bump up against stories that are attributing what we intuit, what we know to be unchristlike, uh, we need to look at different ways to understand those passages of Scripture because the reality is that children, they're given this story, and then they grow up and they start reading the Bible with their own minds and their own eyes, and, and many have thrown out the baby with the bathwater. They've checked out because they can't reconcile the, the love of Jesus with some of these dark depictions of God in the Bible, this being one of many examples. And so on this grand story journey, we've been wrestling, we've been grappling with some of these difficult and dark depictions of God in the Bible. And one of the things that we have been reminding ourselves, and I want to remind us of again today, is that whenever we, we open up the Bible, whether it's the Old Testament or New Testament, we ask that the Holy Spirit, uh, the one who inspired the text, will illuminate our minds and our hearts. And uh, I encourage us to, to bring Jesus along in the scripture, to have Jesus be sort of our, our tour guide. Based on what we know, what we've tasted and seen about God revealed in Jesus Christ, we can, we can use that to help interpret and understand when passages of scripture need to be taken literally, or when we need to understand that these passages, these stories, Noah's Ark being one of them, was told in an ancient time, in an ancient place, and it was an origin story. It was there, it was there trying to understand uh, what God is up to and how God relates to the world. Um, but we shouldn't literalize stories that make God a monster or make God to be any less loving and filled with light than we know uh, when we see uh, as revealed in Christ. And so when, when, we, when we encounter passages of scripture uh, where God is depicted uh, as dark and less than loving than we see in Christ, um, we need to, that should give us pause. That should give us pause to dig deeper, to try and understand that perhaps from time to time these are not windows into the character of God we're reading about, but they're mirrors to our own humanness, to our inability to rightly understand who God is, and to project our own sinfulness, our own violence, uh, upon the text and upon God himself. But what about when we experience darkness in life? You know, it's one thing to wrestle with experiences we read about from a distant place in a distant time, and that can be challenging, that can be disorienting, but it's a whole nother thing when we come face to face with darkness. When we go through what we might call our own dark nights of the soul. Uh, it could be a diagnosis, a physical diagnosis. Uh, a marital or a relational strain or break. Um, it could be, uh, you know, financial hardships, a loss of a job. Uh, the list goes on and on and on. The death of a loved one, the ultimate form of loss and grief. You know, none of us are immune to the darkness of life. You know, Jesus himself said, in this world, you will have trials. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. But let's not take what Jesus said and conclude that uh, each and every dark experience or dark night of the soul is something that is directly caused by God or uh, allowed by God for arbitrary reasons. To say that God is the cause of all things, that, that this God is, is micromanaging and it's one big blueprint as many Christians assume, that everything is God's will that happened. And if we fall into that mentality and that way of thinking, then, then we make God out to be a monster as well. 
really? Is, is God the author of every cancer diagnosis and, and job loss and, and marital breakup and death of a loved one? Are those all uh, coming from God's will and God's hand? Is that uh, aligned with what we know about God as revealed in Jesus Christ and as we taste and see? Uh, I hope we would say a resounding no. And so what do we do when we, when we want to uphold, we want, we want to echo John's passionate statement here that God is light and in him there is no darkness, but sometimes life tells us or seems to suggest otherwise. And so what do we do? What do we do? Well, I, I would encourage us um, to, as, as uh, something I was doing, is to practice the presence of God. And so even as I was ripping out floor, and I, I want to tell you a little bit about this, this flooring story in my kitchen. The message is called Lessons from the Kitchen. So here's some of the lessons that I learned from the kitchen. Uh, in my kitchen, and I'll put the picture uh, back on screen here. In, in the kitchen, um, and you can see the remnants uh, around the dishwasher here of some ceramic tile. And so there's, there's a layer of ceramic tile. And those of you who've been to my kitchen, um, but underneath the ceramic, of course, there's, there's some, there was a layer of underlay, a sort of some wooden underlay. And then below that, though, was an old, that's old yellow linoleum you see here, uh, which was both glued down and stapled down. And underneath that was another layer that had to be removed. So there really was four layers that needed to be removed to get down to the the floorboards the, the floorboards on the bottom um, the plywood uh, in preparation of, of laying down the new flooring and so this was a tedious this was a long deconstruction journey and I think this physical deconstruction journey that I was on in my kitchen very much parallels what can be a, a spiritual deconstruction journey and that's a phrase that gets tossed around a lot these days, spiritual deconstruction. Um, so it's, it's, it's realizing that maybe there's some things that you've thought about or uh, believed that no longer align with wh where you are on the evolution of your journey with Jesus. And so you've got to sort of deconstruct, you've got to tear down and lay aside some things. And that can be a long, arduous, difficult, painful journey just as it was a long, difficult, arduous, painful journey of me removing these tiles. And so I literally, I, I bought a, a chisel hammer and uh, I, I discovered that instead of, I couldn't just break all the tiles. I couldn't just mash them all up because then I'd have thousands and thousands of pieces. And, and underneath the tiles, there was so much glue and so many staples that I had to remove, try and remove each tile one at a time. And so I'd take that chisel hammer and I would take another hammer and I would hammer all around the grout lines. Try and hammer all around the grout lines in one tile. And then I'd get that chisel hammer on its side and hammer it under the tile. And hopefully I'd be able to lift both the tile and the underlay off. And sometimes it came out clean and sometimes it kind of broke in a few pieces. And I'd again have to hammer underneath. And it was, it was a long, tedious process. And it was made more long and tedious because the previous owners, when they put the ceramic tile on top, they didn't remove the original linoleum. They weren't thinking of who's coming next in this house. They were just thinking of what's the easiest way to cover things up and make it look good. And that really is an analogy for the life of the church. And sometimes below the surface, it might look good on the surface, but below the surface, there's some things that are old and ugly and need to be deconstructed and need to be removed. And we need to do the long, tedious, arduous process, like this grand story journey. Sometimes it's been long and, and tedious and arduous to sort of get to the root. And we're really getting to some of the root things, what John has to say about the core and the essence and the nature of God revealed in Christ. But it's messy sometimes. It's arduous. You know, life is messy. Sometimes reading and, and wrestling through scripture sometimes can be beautiful, inspiring. But sometimes if we take it seriously, it can be messy. And it can be daunting. Uh, it's a journey. And just like this deconstruction journey in my house was so arduous and so tedious. And as I'm removing these tiles and I'm getting down, I'm realizing, oh, there's another layer. 
There's literally thousands of one inch staples going through this floor, hardwood staples, and getting down on our hands and knees and physically uh, taking tweezers and pulling, pulling out uh, these staples one at a time, literally thousands of them. And then getting down and trying to rip out their linoleum. If I'm honest, during this process, I, I didn't have some very Christ-like thoughts about the previous owners of this house. Why didn't they take this out before they put the floor down? But they weren't thinking, they weren't forward thinking. They were just thinking of the easiest way to cover what was underneath. And I think it's a reminder that, you know, we want to bring the church forward. We want Valley View Community Church to be a community that is honest, that is loving, that is inclusive and hospitable. And it's not only for ourselves, but it's preparing for the next generation, for our children and our children's children by doing the deconstruction work that is necessary, by laying aside some things that are not true and good and beautiful about God and about God's kingdom. We're getting right down to the foundation as I did in my house and so that we can then do the process of restoring and rebuilding something that is more good and true and beautiful. And it starts with centering or recentering the reality that God indeed is light and there is no darkness whatsoever. And so these are some of the lessons that I was learning and listening uh, in the midst of sweating, in the midst of the frustration and, and literal pain. Here's a picture of my hands uh, full of blisters on my hands, even wearing gloves doing this work. Uh, my hands were sliced up pretty good. I took a knock on my knee one day and sliced that up. Sometimes doing the work of deconstruction, doing the work of, of laying aside and critically thinking about some, some things that have been attacked to the church that we've held on to, that we just take for granted. Uh, sometimes that can be the arduous, painful work, but it's necessary work to clear away some things uh, that can get in the way of us tasting and seeing the goodness of God and then reflecting the light and the love of God to one another and into the community. And so uh, as you're reflecting throughout this day and this week, maybe, maybe you can make, make a list. Talk about this with your spouse, with your children, with maybe your neighbors or friends. You know, what, what in your journey with Jesus have you had to lay aside? Uh, what thoughts or ideas about God or ways of understanding particular Bible passages like perhaps Noah's Ark and maybe come to the realization that maybe it wasn't a, a literal global flood where God wipes out 99.9% .9 of all creation, but it was the ancient uh, uh, tribe's way of reconciling and understanding uh, a localized flood on the Nile River, understanding that, you know, what God or the gods were up to in that day and age that has something theological to tell us about God without literally telling us things about God wiping out uh, the whole world, basically. That's one of many stories that perhaps you've had to wrestle through. What about your own life experiences? Where is God in the midst of pain and brokenness and injustice? When God feels distant and absent, how do you work through those dark nights of the soul? How do you experience and reflect the light of God's love? And so three things, three things I want to encourage you to do, encourage us to do together. One is, is practicing the presence of God practicing the presence of God. I'm not, I'm not talking about simply a, a morning devotional reading or uh, bookending your day with a little token prayer. That's, that's fine and good, but I'm talking about really acknowledging moment by moment throughout the day that God is present. God is with you. God is close. Just as I try to do um, during my uh, home renovation project and removal of floor. That, was, that turned into be a, a, a daunting and a, a difficult but a spiritual experience for reasons that I've shared this morning. And so what are the ways you can practice the presence of God during your rhythm of life and your rhythm of day? What does listening prayer look like for you as we spend time doing most Sunday mornings? Just listening, uh, imagining God being with you because God is with you and among you. Secondly, what, what does community look like for you um, beyond Sunday, beyond this virtual gathering we're a part of this morning? Uh, we all need to have a community, be a part of a community, community of discernment 
to discern good from evil, to, to help us ensure that uh, we are not uh, ascribing things to God that are, are unworthy to God, that are unchristlike. And a community to serve together, to serve one another in love, because ultimately people see and experience the light and love of God, not only in their personal experiences, but as they're on the receiving end of the service and the love of God through the people of God. And so this might be a good chance for you to reflect on what that community is looking like. And maybe, maybe you've been lacking some of that community as it's been a challenge throughout the last couple of years in this pandemic. What is a renewed sense of community engagement in the life of our church or in your neighborhood or with trusted friends? What does that look like for you in this season of your life? How can you move towards a community of discernment and service? And, and third and finally, what, what is uh, this deconstruction process or maybe maybe there's some spiritual detox work that needs to continue to be done in your life, in my life, in the life of our church. And that'll be part of what we are doing going forward. I'm, I've been actually stirred, the Spirit has stirred me, and throughout the rest of the summer and the fall, I'm going to be putting together, uh, I hope to put together a little course, which is simply called Detox looking at the, the issues or the reasons that people throw out the baby with the bathwater. They leave the church, they leave religion, they leave God behind. What are those reasons, the reasons that many, many people are doing that and, and helping people understand that there are more uh, loving and Christ-like ways to look at these particular topics or issues, to detox. As I believe many people are leaving because their impulse is correct. Uh, they've, they've been taught something about God that rubs them the wrong way. They're intuiting that not to be true, but the church has been giving them an unchristlike picture of God or their life experiences or their trauma or their pain or abuse, whatever, has caused them to throw out the baby with the bathwater. And so I want to encourage us individually and as a church, uh, as we extend the light and love of Christ in our community and beyond, uh, to model what, what healthy detox looks like, spiritual detox, not simply deconstruction, if my kitchen was just bare, that's not the end of the goal. The end goal is not to strip everything bare, but it's so that we can build something more beautiful together, a more Christ-like God, a more beautiful gospel that we are called uh, to represent to one another and to our community. And so, so here is a picture of uh, what my kitchen is looking like these days. And we just got some kitchen cabinets installed and, and we went through the long arduous deconstruction process and now uh, we're building something beautiful. And that really is uh, hopefully an analogy of, of what Valley View Community Church is as we continue to both do the detox work that needs to be done, but also the rebuilding, the rebuilding of something good, something true and something beautiful together because God indeed is light and in him there is no darkness at all and Jesus says we are the light of the world we are called to be salt we are called to be light and so that is our mission that is our mandate individually and collectively is to both take time to do that detox that deconstruction work to lay aside some some beliefs that can hinder us from extending the grace and the peace indiscriminately to those we encounter this day and this week amen amen I want to close with this quote from John Wesley. I want to give John Wesley, uh, a man who loved uh, 1 John, uh, I want to give him a last word. And he wrote in one of his sermons, he says this. He says, It is in consequence of our knowing God loves us, tasting and seeing that God loves us, that we love him and love our neighbor as ourselves. Gratitude towards our creator cannot but produce benevolence to our fellow creatures. The love of Christ constrains us not only to be harmless, to do no ill to our neighbor, but to be useful, to be zealous of good works, as we have time to do good unto all men, and to be patterns to all of true, genuine morality of justice, mercy, and truth. Amen. Amen. And so that, that is our mission. That is what we have been called to, uh, to be patterns to all of true, genuine morality of justice, mercy, and truth. Let's pursue justice, mercy, and truth this day and this week as we receive afresh the light and the love of Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you that you are light. I thank you that you are love. I pray that we would receive afresh your light and your love, that you would empower us 
and enable us to wrestle, to deconstruct, uh, to detox from what needs to be laid aside in pursuit of a beautiful gospel, a more Christ-like God, as we serve one another in love this day and this week. Amen. Amen. God bless each and every one of you. Have a fantastic week. I look forward uh, to seeing you again soon. God bless.